Hello there. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. And live from New York, it's Tuesday night. My name is Ken Chea. I am the president of the Linnaean Society of New York, and I'd like to call this meeting to order. Well, let me begin by wishing everybody a very, very happy 2021. Congratulations on making it through another year and what a year it was. Here's an idea. Let's plan to do it again, but this time different. Let's try for a better, happier, kinder, and with some hope and science, a much healthier year in 21. Being here tonight with you demonstrates and confirms uh, not only the importance of nature in our world, but also the importance of community. You didn't have to be here. You could be posting a bird list or doing the dishes or watching Netflix uh, instead. So thank you. Thank you for joining us and being part of this meeting and part of the Linnaean online community. Uh, according to my participants list, woo, there's 209 people watching right now, 211. Hey, it's climbing. Very, very good. Keep going, folks. Very exciting. So uh, welcome, everybody. I'd like to give a quick shout out to my team of fellow officers, council and committee members, and past presidents whose time and effort continued to keep the society moving steadily through 2020 and tonight as we begin a new year. Without their hard work and support, we would not be streaming live right now or welcoming new members each month or reaching you through social media or sponsoring Linnaean field trips. They, they are a great group of teammates and I'm honored to work alongside them. For tonight's program, this marks our fifth speaker meeting taking place live online and our first meeting, of course, of 2021. Uh, and since we still have no further news from the American Museum of Natural History uh, as to when we may expect to return to the Linder Theater for live on site programs, we will continue to bring you our future meetings delivered fresh to your home right here on Zoom. For tonight's program, we have disabled the Zoom chat feature, as well as video and microphone. One thing we have not disabled is the Q&A feature. During tonight's program, you may use that feature, it's at the bottom of your screen, to send us any questions you may have for the speaker. Following the speaker's presentation, our Vice President Rochelle Thomas will take time to select a few of your questions. Because our membership now has the opportunity to vote by email. And thank you all, by the way, thank you so much members for returning your votes. I have only two business items to announce this evening. With, drum roll please, 106 votes of approval and zero votes of opposition, motion number one, has passed and it gives me great pleasure to welcome the following three applicants as new members of the Linnaean Society of New York. David Greenspan, sponsored by Lydia Thomas. Constance Wiley, sponsored by Susan Schur. And Tom Kenny, sponsored by Rochelle Thomas. So David, Constance, and Tom, if any of you are out there right now, and I hope you are, uh, imagine you're hearing a roaring ocean of applause generated by all the members of the society streaming through hundreds of computers and bouncing around in your living room. Now, doesn't that feel good? And aren't you glad you're not watching Netflix tonight? Congratulations to all and welcome to the Linnaean Society of New York. And by the way, if any of you out there are wondering about becoming a member, well, we would love to hear from you. Just go to our website. That's LinnaeanNewYork.org. Should I spell it? I think I will. L-I-N-N-A-E-A-N-N-E-W-Y-O-R-K.org. LinnaeanNewYork.org. 
www.thepeopleshow.org and you will find all the information that you need. Now, in case you need a sponsor and maybe you don't know that many members yet, don't worry, I got your back. You can contact me and I'll be happy to be your sponsor. In addition, you may contact other officers as well, uh, officers of the society about sponsorship. Uh, there's Vice President Rochelle Thomas. There is Treasurer Ruth Hart, uh, Secretary Lydia Thomas. What would we do without her? And Jonathan Hyman, uh, our editor. Uh, these are all delightful people and solid choices. So take your pick. Just go to the bottom of our homepage, click on contacts. This will all be on the final quiz. And there you will find email addresses of all the officers I just mentioned. You may contact any one of us for more information or for sponsorship. And please remember, any society or organization is only as healthy as its growing and diverse membership. That's important, so I'm going to say it again. Any society or organization is only as healthy as its growing and diverse membership. We would love to hear from you and welcome you to our community. You want more good news? Here it is. In addition, motion two to accept the December general meeting minutes also passed by a vote of another drum roll, please. 103 to zero. So once again, the yays are dominating the nays tonight, the way I like it. And more importantly, voting is really, really an important and critical thing of that what we do. It's a big part of what we do as members. So again, I want to thank everybody who took the time to send in their votes by email. And also, as a reminder, I would like to add that although we've been meeting on Zoom since September, this is still an official meeting of the society. And as such, it is still a forum for topics of interest to our membership. If you have a topic or an announcement under the item of new business that you would like to propose for us to consider, please send me a note at president at Linnaean newyork.org or the secretary secretary at linnaean newyork.org and those email addresses once again can be found where that's right at the bottom of our home page under contacts those of you who know me well you know that some of my best friends are trees so i'm personally very thrilled and honored to introduce this evening's speaker. David Haskell has won acclaim for eloquent writing and deep engagement with the natural world. In this talk, he will describe how he has integrated contemplative, literary, and scientific studies of the natural world. What might be learned by paying repeated attention to very small parts of our neighborhoods or forests? David has explored this question by returning again and again to the same square meter of old growth forest in Tennessee. And in addition, repeatedly visiting individual trees in various locations all around the world. These explorations reveal the biological connections that sustain all life in places as diverse as Manhattan, Denver and Jerusalem, forests such as uh, those in the Amazon, the Rockies and boreal forests, and areas on the front lines of environmental change, including eroding coastlines, burned mountainsides and war zones. In each location, attention to the sensory richness of place has yielded insight to both ecology and ethics. David Haskell's first book, the Forest Unseen was a finalist for the 2013 Pulitzer Prize in nonfiction and received numerous honors, including the National Academy's Best Book Award for 2013. His second book, Song, The Songs of Trees, examines biological networks through the lives of a dozen trees around the world. 
The book was winner of the 2018 John Burroughs Medal and the 2020 Iris Book Award. Dr. Haskell received his BA from the University of Oxford and PhD from Cornell University. He is professor of biology and, Env and environmental studies at the University of the South in Sewanee, Tennessee, and is a fellow of the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation. He serves on the boards and advisory committees of local and national land conservation groups. Please join me now in welcoming tonight's speaker, David Haskell. Thank you, Cam, for that wonderful introduction. It's a delight to, to be with you all. I want to uh, start by uh, acknowledging that I am uh, coming to you now, speaking to you from now from the unceded land of the Arapaho, and I pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. I offer my thanks to the Linnaean Society and all the officers and others who behind the scenes have created this opportunity for us to gather this evening and for the other programs that I know have, have inspired and nourished and, and lifted me in, in this time of, of isolation. Um, it's, it's a particular honor for me now to, to join you in, the, in this moment of fragmentation and, and at least of, of physical distance, a, a challenging uh, time for all of us. Um, and, and the Linnaean Society's work in providing these programs, and it's a lot of work behind, behind the scenes, uh, organizing and scheduling and, and advertising them, um, I off, I, it means a lot to me and, and I'm incredibly honored to, to be part of that work here uh, today. And the, the isolation that we're experiencing now through the coronavirus <clears throat> brings to the fore one aspect of life's community. Uh, that sometimes for the good of ourselves and for society, we need to be cautious about interconnection and establish some distance between us and others. And that's true also in so-called normal times, in non-pandemic non times. Witness our skin, a barrier to keep uh, other organisms uh, out, our immune system uh, that does the job of discerning a friend from foe. But this necessity for distance and for barriers is just one aspect of, of nature, of life's community. And alongside this, this necessity for a certain measure of caution is the truth that we live always and only in relationship with others. In other words, alone is not an option. The individual in a way is, is an illusion. We can't do it alone. Life is made from interconnection. And that's one of the themes of, of, of my talk. I'm going to describe some, some of the different connections that make up the lives of the trees that, that I've studied uh, over the years. Now, trees, by virtue of their longevity, their great size, uh, and their immobility, are champion networkers. They're champions at, at forming cooperative interconnections with others. Now, their long lives means that they have many opportunities for interconnection with diverse groups of, of other organisms. Their, their great size, both above and below the ground, means that they have an, a great surface area and all sorts of diverse uh, cells that can reach out and connect with others. So size in, is an advantage in, the, in this, um, uh, in, in their work as, as interconnectors. And immobility also is a spur to interconnection and cooperation. Because other than the, than the times when they are present as pollen or as seeds maybe floating through the air or being carried in the gut of a bird, trees are immobile. They have to make it work where they are, where they rooted. They're, there are a few clonal, clonal trees that can send out roots and grow and move a few meters during, during their lives. But by and large, where you land as a tree seed is where you're going to be, perhaps for hundreds of years. And therefore, unlike animals who have the option of getting up and leaving when things aren't working out so well, trees have to cooperate and get along with the other beings around them. 
sending a root down into the soil. There's no possibility for social distancing down there. There are thousands of species of bacteria and fungi all around you. You got to make it work with, with, it, with these others. And so trees are amazing networkers, for, partly for that reason, of the sort of the immobility, which seems to be a constraint, actually turns out into, into something of, a, of a, a benefit for them. So when we look at a tree, our human senses deceive us. We see uh, what seems to be an individual. And in fact, trees are sometimes used as, as symbols and metaphors of individuality and strength. Where I'm from, I was born in London, the English oak standing alone and strong against the world. How's that working out uh, over there <laughs> right now? Not so well. The, the, the point is that the trees seem to be individuals, but in fact, they live in communities. What it, and what is true for a tree is also true for, uh, uh, for we humans as well. And so another theme in, in this talk is to, is to try and make the case that tree lives and human lives are intertwined. That the individuality of the tree and the individuality of the human, in fact, are temporary manifestations of something much deeper and that is the relationships that sustain and connect us all. And the stuff of ecology and of evolution are the negotiations and the drama of how those relationships play out. It's not a big love fest out there. There is both cooperation and conflict and present within these ecological, ecological networks. So I've sought out these uh, stories of, of trees and, and of forests. Um, partly through science, but for the last about 15 years, mostly through picking very small places and returning again and again to those places. I did that first in an old growth forest in Tennessee, where I picked a single square meter of forest and returned again and again through the better part, well, for, for a year, spending a lot of time down there trying to open my senses. What's the soundscape happening? What am I smelling in the leaf litter today compared to yesterday? How is the quality of light shifting? What species are present here and what are some of their stories? So by returning in this sort of meditative mode and ecological meditation, if you like, to one square meter of forest, I tried to understand, just glimpse the edge of some of how that forest is put together and functions and connects to us. And I told some of those stories in, in this book, the, the Forest Unseen. I'm not going to, to spend much time on that uh, tonight. I'm going to focus more on, on uh, the trees. But that practice of returning again and again to one place is one that I then extended in the next book, The Songs of Trees, where I picked about a dozen trees and returned to those individuals that are living communities, so the individuality again is an illusion, but returned again and again over many years to sit with the tree, to just show up for a change. As a teacher and as a scientist, I'm always talking. How about being quiet and listening? And by listening, I, I mean literally listening to the sounds within the tree, the, the birds and the insects in the tree, but also the sounds present within wood that you can pick up with particular with special senses. And the sounds of wind and ice and rain and, and the tree revealing its architecture. So by listening, we can quite literally understand some of the life of the tree. And then listening in a more metaphorical way, and that is listening by talking to people whose lives are closely connected with these trees and by delving into the scientific and anthropological literature to understand how trees are interconnected with people in this place, what we've come, come to know. Um, so it, what we really should do for the rest of this talk is just sit in silence <laughs> and, and attend to our senses. And I'm not gonna do that, but I might suggest that as an invitation to you uh, to, to take on some of these practices as pick a tree and return to it again and again and, and put your hands on it on, on its bark. Listen to its changing sounds through the season. Understand the aromas and, and what they mean. How is the quality of light changing in and around this tree? And through repeated engagement with an individual tree, come to befriend that place, that, that knot of interactions and relationships that is the tree and see where your curiosity uh, will, will lead you.
So today, um, instead of taking that sort of meditative approach, um, I'm going to flit around a little bit, go from one tree to another, four or five different trees, and try to, uh, to convey a little bit of some of the character of, of each tree. Um, and these are trees that are located in very different places. And to underscore some of the relationships that give that tree life and that then fall back into, uh, into, human, into human life. So the first tree, I'm going to uh, start sharing my uh, slides here. Okay, so for this first tree, we crank up the humidity to 100%. It's just rained. Uh, the temperature is in the, it's probably about 90 degrees Fahrenheit here. Uh, we're at the top of a Saber pentandra tree in Eastern Ecuador uh, in the Amazon rainforest. Uh, so this is a tree that is located, some of you may know this site, Tiputini Research Station. Uh, it's on the edge of Yasuni by the, by the uh, biodiversity preserve, <clears throat> and also on the edge of other protected lands, uh, both in Ecuador and, and countries around it. From the top of this tree, look all around, and there are thousands of square kilometers of almost unbroken Amazon forest. So this is one of the more remote places in the world. It's also the place that, as far as we know, when we try and map out biodiversity, which is really a map um, made in ignorance because we don't know uh, the, the biodiversity of, of, of any one group of organisms, even the well-known groups like birds and trees, let alone the insects and the fungi and the bacteria. But when we plot that out, this spot shows up as either the most biodiverse place in the terrestrial world or one of the, the top two or three. So incredible uh, diversity in one hectare of forest. You've got 600 species of tree, 400 different bird species, 150 frogs, 60,000 different insects, nine species of wild primate uh, living in, in groups in and around the tree. And a, a place where uh, life's great diversity presses down on our senses, grabs the human by every sense, and, and sometimes it's terrifying, the, 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 the amplitude of sound and the intensity of the, of the aroma and, and the number of insects trying to suck the blood out, uh, out of your skin and your eyeballs and, and so forth. And other times it's just wondrous, uh, the, the, the beauty of, of, of the bird song and, and, the, and, the, and the very textures of the trees and, and so forth, incredible. So this tree, and it, this photograph is taken from high up, we're about 40 meters off the ground here, so several stories up um, in, in human uh, building units, um, looking out over the rest of the rainforest. And unlike temperate forests, rainforests have emergent trees, trees that stand 10 or more meters above the others in the forest. So when you get up in the canopy, you can look around and look down on these other really, really tall trees. This tree is a hub of life, is, is the ladder that um, uh, takes you up. <clears throat> not a place for uh, the vertiginous, or if you are vertiginous, you just, as I am, uh, you just get on with it and get up there and, and, and try and get over it. And here's what you find at the top. You can barely see the tree itself. So there's a, there's a branch running through the middle of this, but it's covered in, in moss and then little orchids and young fig trees growing out of here, all sorts of other plants growing on top of this other tree. The tree has Mat, large fig trees growing on in its crown. So there are hundreds of other species of plant gathered on and in this one individual sabo tree. Sabo is what the uh, local uh, people in, in this region call it. So that's what I've called, I'll call it here and, and in my writings about this tree. Lots of bromeliads, these bromeliads hold water, several liters of water. The tree is a sky lake, one hectare of forest here holds about 50,000 liters of water. That's about 250 whiskey barrels of water up there in the air that are home to, to all kinds of colorful and interesting frogs and insects, beings that never ever come down from the tree canopy. They spend their whole life up there because these are wetlands. They're also deserts. Some of the, the more exposed branches have little cacti and other things growing on them. Extraordinary hub of life. 
all that life means there's a lot of competition. So as a tree, here's, here's one uh, tree leaf um, peppered um, with, um, with marks from herbivores. So there are about 30,000 species of herbivores, mostly insects, in any hectare of Ecuadorian forest here. So they're all chewing on tree leaves. So an incredibly difficult place to live. And, and half of the weight of some young tree leaves are comprised of poison. So this is a place where there's a heck of a lot of competition. And for animals, there are fungi trying to, to infect you. There are creatures trying to, to pierce your skin and, and get blood and, and so forth. So intense competition. So th this is a story we're familiar with, right? Tennyson's nature red in tooth and claw, competition. And what does that competition do? It forces us into individuality. <coughs> that, in fact, is not true. This great competitive furnace in the rainforest hasn't broken life apart into individuals, into atoms, into separation and aloneness. Instead, it has welded cooperative partnerships. The only way to make it in the Amazon rainforest, whether you're a uh, fungus or an ant or a tree or a bird, is in relation with others. For the tree, that cooperation means that in these very nutrient poor old soils of the Amazon, where most of the nutrients are held up in the biomass, there's almost nothing out there in the soil, you need to unite your roots with cooperative symbiotic fungi to forage for phosphorus and other minerals, transfer that back to the tree, and then you as a tree reciprocate with sugars and other forms of organic, or organic nutrients. So that, that's a cooperative union that happens in many, many other plants, but it is of a particular importance in these very challenging soils in the Amazon. This leaf that we're looking at, we, we humans give it a name, a noun, leaf, one noun. We do that, I mean, like sugar maple leaf or inga plant leaf or oak leaf or white pine needle. That noun is a lie. Because if you look inside this leaf, what you'll find are dozens of species of fungi, hundreds of species of bacteria. Only recently have we been able to do this with, with DNA sequencing technology and with microbiology to figure out that the leaf is a living community. There are species in there that are not plant cells. In fact, there are dozens of dozens of species and the leaf's function and its viability depends on the health of that community. A leaf can't protect itself from drought. It can't deter herbivores without cooperative unions between bacteria and fungi uh, and plant cells all working together. Now, there are also the bad guys, the fungi and bacteria that are pathogens, and how does the leaf fight them off? Not alone, but in union with some more cooperative fungi and, and, and bacteria. So the leaf is a living community just as the root is. And what is true of, of plants is also true of the animals. The primates here all live in cooperative social groups. There's a lot of social tensions within them. But if, if, a, if a, um, a marmoset uh, or a sake monkey or something is, is expelled from a group, it is not going to be able to survive in, in, in the forest. The same true for ants, of course. Uh, famous examples from, from the rainforest of leaf cutter, leaf cutter ants working with both fungi and bacteria to farm uh, fungi in order to decompose leaves to, to feed the ants. And so the paradox of the rainforest is that out of the place where biological competition and biological warfare is most intense and well-developed, you have the most intense and uh, intimate partnerships that allow species to thrive. And what's true of uh, plants and non-human animals in the forest is also true of human communities, human cultures that have evolved and developed in relation to this forest. Uh, during my visits to Ecuador, I was lucky to, to meet and uh, interview some Warani. The Warani are, are a group of people who have lived in this region for thousands of years in, in the forest, working but 
living as agrarians and as hunter-gatherers. I mean, these are, these are ter Western terms that we might impose that don't do justice to the complexity and the depth of the understanding that Warani culture carries within it of the forest. And here's how the Warani do plant taxonomy. They don't give species individual names as we Western scientists do who are locked into this individualistic way of thinking. The name of every plant species depends on its context. Is it growing on a high elevation or lower wetter soils? Is it being used for one use in the community or another? And the sabo tree is the tree of life in the Warani creation story, used for all sorts of uh, uh, practical uses, uh, finding food because there are lots of uh, plants and animals there. Also, the fluff around the cotton is used to wrap the ends of uh, arrows that can be then put into pipes uh, to hunt. So this tree is, is essential for ongoing life in, in the forest. And tree and other plants are given names that depend on context, that depend on relationship. And the same is true for people. Your name is not your individual name. It's a name that depends on the social group that you're in. If you leave one group and go to another, you lose your old name and get a new name in the new social group. And usually you cannot then go back. And so your identity, your nomenclature, if you like, is a product of the group. So embedded with it, within the language and the way in which people describe one another and, the, and plants uh, is an understanding that, uh, that, um, that life is always and only in relationship. Now, contrast that with a hero of North American uh, Western view of nature, Thoreau. He told us he went to the woods to live by the labor of my hands only. He was in love with this notion of individuality, of shedding dependence on others. He sounds frankly like Trump. I alone. It's a dogma of separation, of individuality, of atomism. And for the Thoreau, of course, it was an illusion. It was a lie because his sisters were doing his laundry and bringing him food every, every year. He had lots of people over his, to his cabin out there in Walden. He didn't write about any of that stuff. The, the, the whole sort of individuality part of Walden is carefully manufactured because, in fact, as we know, human life doesn't work that way, and nor does life in the forest. You don't live by the labor of your hands alone. You live in mutual reciprocal dependence on others. And the Warani have, have understood that for, for thousands of years in the forest and has come reflected in their, in their uh, stories and their language. They told me that anyone who goes to the woods to live on their own in self-reliance is prof either profoundly ill or really, really angry. Either way, they're destined for death. So this, this idea of mutualism is, is built deep into to Warani under, understanding of, of what, it, <clears throat> what it means to be a human and what it means to be a human in relation to the forest. Now, this, this sort of dogma of, of separation and individuality is also present, of course, in biology and in economics. For 150 years, we have talked about evolution mostly in atomistic individualistic terms, that the fundamental unit of evolution is the individual or the gene the unit of conservation is the species. We count up these individuals and, and, we, and, and we believe that that's the nature of life. That's a useful and powerful way of looking at the world, but it's only partially true. The other way, a complementary way, is to say that the fundamental nature of life is not individuality, but interconnection and relationship. And therefore the task for biologists is to ask, how are these relationships sustaining life in this present moment and how they change through time by evolution and through ecological processes. And the ethical task for us is to ask, how can we be good members of community in right relationship with other beings? So a shift, a revolution, I think is underway in, in how we think about our biology, <clears throat> but also how I think we need to be thinking about ethics. And you know, this, understanding of, uh, of uh, 
the importance of, of interconnection and relationship is being brought home to us by our electronic devices. What is it that Amazon and Facebook and the NSA want from us when they're taking all that data out of our cell phones? They don't care about the individual cell phone or the device or the laptop. It's who we've liked, what we've clicked, what are the patterns of interconnection that we have formed. We reveal ourselves through these relationships. That is what gets monetized. And that is what um, identifies us within the network, not uh, individuality. So the individual in that view is, is a hub within a series of, of interconnected uh, networks. Now, this place here, here's a, one of my favorite pictures from Ecuador. These are mosses. It's so humid that the mosses take wing. Uh, they're flying out into the humid air, almost like algae wafting in, in the sea. This place that is, that is the crucible and the home for so much biodiversity and for much cultural diversity, in addition to the Warani, there are dozens of other indigenous uh, peoples living in, in these forests, uh, is now... Um, being degraded by oil extraction. These are some, some off, off flarings uh, that I saw from the um, oil industry um, approaching <clears throat> Tiputini. Right now, the price of oil is low, so the pressure is, uh, is somewhat reduced. Um, but roads <clears throat> and other ways of getting the oil out of the, the forest um, are proceeding. And as that happens, of course, biodiversity is lost, but so are uh, indigenous land rights, and so are, are the lives of people who live in this region. And as we face our own crises here in, in our own country, now the newspaper has run one particular name above the crease now for more than four years. Um, let's remember that we live on a planet where 12 million hectares of forest are lost every year. 4 million hectares of primary tropical forest are being lost every year. And that rate of loss is currently accelerating, not going down. So tropical forests are of course home to most of the world's terrestrial biodiversity, but they're also home to many, many indigenous peoples. So there's an enormous human rights crisis happening now through deforestation, through the loss of land rights and the loss of lives um, of, for indigenous people. And what is the solution to this? Well, in Ecuador, groups that were formerly in conflict, say different cultural groups, tribes, have now learning from the forest said, we need to unite to fight this challenge. And they've done that and have become a powerful political force in Ecuador, even getting the rights of nature written into the Ecuadorian constitution, something we might learn from here. And now they're reaching out to us to ask for our help, whether it's from Ecuador or Borneo. The last two years have seen many, many cries of help from indigenous groups. And I think for all of us who, who value forests and trees, we need to remember that we are in brotherhood and sisterhood, not just with the trees and the birds and, and the primates, but with other human beings who need our help. So the fundamental, fundamental nature of the forest is reciprocity. We're being called on to reciprocate from our positions of power and influence in the Western world uh, to stop some of the, the great uh, tragedies of injustice that are unfolding as we speak. My second tree, my second illustration of the interconnections between trees and people is in a very different climate. Humidity goes way down <laughs> from nearly 100% to uh, down by 10 or 20% on, on some days. This is in Jerusalem. This is the Damascus Gate outside the, uh, one of the gates into the old city of Jerusalem. And in the foreground, you see tree branches and leaves. This is an olive tree that grows right here on the gates of, of the old city of Jerusalem. It was probably planted here in the 1960s. It was already an old tree. It was transplanted from an agricultural area when they redid the plaza here. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, a tree that is maybe 100 years old outside the city here, teaching us the story that the fate of civilizations and human cultures in the Middle East are deeply entwined with this olive. 
So here's looking out from um, the Mount of Olives towards uh, the old city of Jerusalem. And each one of these leaves has a little silvery fuzz over it and that protects the leaf during these times of drought. The Mediterranean climate is generally very dry and hot all summer and often a lot of the spring and the fall as well. And then kind of wet and cool in the winter time. I mean, occasionally it will even, even snow up here. Uh, and so the olive tree, incredibly good at thriving in this, in this environment. It can really shut down water loss from its leaves during the, the, um, during the, uh, uh, the dry times. And it's really good at sucking up that water when the rains finally come and then producing these nutritious fruits that we see here. And for hundreds of thousands of years, those fruits were feeding thrushes and pigeons and other birds who would do the job of seed dispersal, right? Same story all over the world. The bird eats the fruit, gets a little reward for that in the form of some oil and protein and maybe a little sugars, and then poops the seed out somewhere else and disperses the plant. So a, a, a symbiosis that goes back um, to the origin of flowering plants probably at least 100 million years ago and takes diverse forms now around the world. Now, 8,000 years ago, humans came into the picture and said, these are actually not bad. Yeah, pretty good to eat, especially if we brine them a little bit to get some of the, the bitterness out of them. Um, why don't we work with this tree and, and pick out the varieties that really have nice, fat, juicy olives for us to eat? So 8,000 years ago, the olive tree and humans in the Mediterranean region uh, united their destinies, if you like, in a process we call domestication, which is a very human-centered version of, of things. In a way, the, the tree domesticated us because we humans clear out competing vegetation, bring irrigation pipes, stop wildfires, act as servants of, of these trees. So it really is a symbiosis. No one partner is in full control here. And there's a good reason from a human perspective for this because this is one of the few plants that will feed you in this seasonally arid environment. There is as much food and, and much calorific value in a cup of olive oil as there is in the same volume of red meat. And olive oil is produced from this land much more abundantly than, than red meat. And so the fate of human civilizations in this area and the fate of the olive tree are bound up one to another. Here's a, a, an olive trunk that's probably a thousand years old. And you, you can see the various lumps on this. What are those? That's the tree over decades, moving resources to one side of the tree and another, growing new roots, expanding parts of its trunk to take advantage of, of, of wet areas, say on the left side here, it was wet for a couple of decades. And then the stream course changed sh shifted a little bit, and then it was wet on the right hand side. And the tree's trunk reflects that that uh, motion, growing extra wood to take advantage of of the um, of changing resources on a decadal scale. So these very old olive trees have written in their bark the history of how they've been searching for uh, searching for water. This is underneath the Damascus Gate. The old city of Jerusalem is a city built on another city built on another one. So if you get down below the modern city, you find a whole Roman city underneath that. And below that, there are, there are remains that are yet older. This is an old olive press that sits almost directly underneath the tree whose photo I, I just showed you on the, on the north side of Jerusalem, reminding us that this dependence on trees, on this mutual interdependence between trees and people goes back a long way, we get a better idea of that history by going to the Dead Sea. Because here's what happens. The winds blow pollen from the mountain ridge that Jerusalem and Ramallah and some of these other cities are located on, and it blows it east here, and that pollen then lands in the Dead Sea. And the Dead Sea has been there for uh, tens of thousands of years. And every year, a new little layer of mud has added. And so at the bottom of the Dead Sea, you have a record of the pollen that grew in the Jerusalem highlands, going back thousands of years. And you can go to the Dead Sea and 
see that record kind of with your unaided eye, this is <clears throat> the uh, one bank of the Dead Sea where you can see these terraces. This is where the water was five years ago, 10 years ago, 15, 20, and so forth. The Dead Sea is shrinking down, down, and down, and down. Maybe it'll be gone within a few decades, maybe not, depends on water management strategies in the Middle East. But each one of these is a layered set of, of history. You take a mud sample out of this and put it under the microscope, you see pollen grains of all kinds of different plant species, including this one, which is olive. And so you can look in the layers of mud at the bottom of the Dead Sea and how, see how olive trees have either been abundant or very rare on the landscape. And what this pollen record teaches us is that wherever, pollen, wherever the trees have thrived, wherever olive trees have thrived, humans have done really, really well as well. And whenever that bond has been broken, trees and humans disappear from the landscape. And sometimes humans, the disappearance is entire, you know, entire civilizations disappearing, no archeological record for decades. And what is it that breaks that bond? It's either extended drought or war. Otherwise, even in fairly dry times, people and olive trees can make it work. And particularly when, when people started inventing irrigation, the Romans bring um, aqueducts and, and water management, lots of olives, even in fairly dry times. So here's one example of this. This is from a, a peer reviewed study of <clears throat> one sample. There are other, lots of other studies, say from the Sea of Galilee and so forth that tell similar tales. What we're looking at here is a mud column um, going back 10,000 years. So at the bottom, this is the lowest layer of mud. At the top, this is the most recent layer of mud. And you can see the time scale goes back to 10,000 years. Left two columns, a quercus, which are different types of oaks. Wherever it's high and dark, that's when there's a lot of pollen. And whether, whenever it's low, that means there's not much pollen. You can see this, Leah, this is olives. Uh, there wasn't so much of it 8,000 years ago, then it was domesticated. And then here in the Bronze Age, woohoo, trees are doing great, and so are people. Amazing uh, flourishing of, of human civilizations. And this red arrow is what the archaeologists call the late Bronze Age collapse, where the civilizations there that had amazing <clears throat> cities, uh, incredible written records and libraries all just disappear and the last written, excuse me, the last written records are of people pleading for grain shipments because of the famine. What happened here was massive extended decadal droughts <clears throat> that wiped off vegetation from the land. You can see the uh, olive oil, the olive pollen really dropped down, uh, creating a, a crisis for people in this time that didn't then fully rebound until hundreds of years later. And then by the time um, uh, a couple of thousand years ago and, and, be, and after that, when people got good at water management, um, olives again started thriving. I, I haven't shown it here, but some of the pollen records also show that in Roman times, not only were there a lot of olives, there was a lot of grape pollen. So these Romans really loved their wine as well. Um, so maybe that can be uh, another book, the, the Songs of Wine. <laughs> um, perhaps not. Okay, so no wonder then that the Abrahamic religions all have olive oil at the center of uh, their holy scripts and, and of, of rituals. This, olive oil is not just a, a, a metaphor. People understood that their life was possible because of their relationship with this tree. Hanukkah, the festival of lights, a celebration of olive oil that produces unending plent and unexpected plentitude. In the Quran, God is compared to the light of, the, of, a, of a pure olive oil lamp, so burning olive oil again. The Christ, what does Christ mean? It means the anointed one. You don't get anointed with water or canola oil, anointed with olive oil. Not just a symbol, but in fact, a, a, a direct ecological statement about mutual dependence with trees. 
Now, this is this relationship with trees as, as calorific foundations for life is present in many other parts of the world. I'll briefly give you one other example. Uh, this is from Scotland. So here, <clears throat> the ground is being torn up to build the Queen's Ferry Bridge, one of Europe's biggest infrastructure projects, connecting uh, the south and the north side of the Firth of Forth, just west of Edinburgh. Now, if you're a road builder, you really don't, this, the, the news you don't wanna hear when you come into work in the morning is, we've dug up the oldest known example of human settlement anywhere in Scotland. But in fact, that's what happened to these poor road engineers. They had to delay the whole project until the archeologists could come up and excavate this extraordinary village site that was the first known human remains, evidence of human habitation after the ice age. So all of Scotland was covered in ice during the ice age. As the glaciers retreated, people moved up and re-inhabited the landscape. One of their villages was right here and it was dug up. And what did we find when we dug it up? Charcoal, lots of charcoal, and not just any charcoal, but this, hazelnuts. These are 10,000 years old. They now sit in little baggies in the archeologist's office in, in Edinburgh. They look like they just came out of a campfire yesterday. They're so fresh and well-preserved underneath uh, the soil here, partly because they've been mostly carbonized and carbonized things preserve very well. So 10,000 years old, the people who were living here who had colonized these most Northern parts of Europe at the time, we're living mostly off the food provided by hazelnuts, the same stuff that we eat when we buy a bag of hazelnuts from Trader Joe's. I mean, the species are slightly different depending on whether you're in North America or Europe and so on, but it's the same kind of plant. Not only were people feeding from these plants, but also heating the village because you can coppice hazel. You take a hazel tree and cut it. Within a few years, it sprouts a whole load of new little stems you cut them, it re-sprouts, cut and re-sprout. Re and that practice of coppicing still is a very important way of forest management in, in much of, of Europe. So the colonization of Northern Europe after the Ice Age was made possible because of a relationship between people and trees. It's possible that tr people brought hazelnuts with them to seed the landscape as they colonized. We don't know. Almost certainly birds helped. So European jays carry these and that the hazelnut tra traveled from its refugia down in the Mediterranean where it hung out during the ice age up to the Northern parts of Europe much, much faster than other species like oaks. Partly because jays helped birds, but also maybe because people helped and because the hazels have got this amazing below ground partnership, their roots are literally wrapped up in fungus so the fungus forms a sheath around the roots that protects it from very cold, acidic soils, the kind of soils that you find in these northern parts of Europe. And this is a story not just from Scotland, but also from Germany and uh, Scandinavia. Whenever people dig up these Mesolithic villages, they find what they call the age of nuts. After 2020, we might think we're in the age of nuts now, but this was a literal age of nuts where people were feeding on trees, not on oats and grains and other things that came later with the Neolithic revolution, um, but the colonization of Northern Europe was made possible because of mutualistic uh, connection with, with trees. So when you're, uh, uh, if you're ever in Scotland and you see the Queensferry Bridge is the one in the background here, the Firth of Forth Bridge, which is the more, uh, the older one that was <clears throat> and partly replaced by the new one. When you see these, remember that they are built on the remains of the first uh, villages of uh, people who lived in Northern Europe after the Ice Age. And when you flip on the light switch, the electricity that powers the light or turns on the laptop may well also be coming from a modern incarnation of this dependence on trees. Because a lot of the so-called green energy in the UK now, as the UK has transitioned almost entirely away from coal, is coming from the southeastern United States where, where pellets of clear cut trees are sent over to, to Europe to burn in old, old coal fired power stations. Um, 
So, and then there's some sort of some pretty dubious accounting that goes into, in my opinion, uh, that goes into defining this as a green form of energy. But even now, in this seeming modern uh, society that uh, that we're living in, our dependence on trees uh, is is intense. Now, these relationships between people and trees manifest also in the middle of cities. So here is a tree that I spent many years going back to on in Manhattan. Uh, and on the Upper West Side, this is the corner of 86th and Broadway. Uh, the, 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 the number one line uh, subway is right there. So if, you, if you're in that part of the town, you may have walked right past this tree. And this is, of course, is a photo from pre-COVID times. Uh, this sign here uh, on the store, I think, is hanging in front of the White House for the next week, soon to be taken down. Uh, our attention is on this tree, this beautiful tree that actually canopies the sidewalk and reaches out over two lanes of Broadway. So you look down Broadway as if you're in this, this uh, arbor, this promenade, uh, and the you know, big trucks coming past all the time and so forth, brushing against the tree. This is a calorie pear, originally native to China. <clears throat> the uh, USDA or the, the federal predecessor of the U USDA in 1916 sent uh, a Dutch botanical explorer to China, uh, Frank Meyer, to find trees, particularly pear trees, that could be imported to the US and interbred with other pears to give resistance to the disease called fire blight. Fire blight is a bacterial disease that destroyed, uh, especially in the early 1900s was completely wiping out the pear crop all across North America. So there was a great deal of interest in importing uh, breeding stock that might be resistant. And one of the products of those breeding experiments is this, the calorie pear, this is in the horticultural trade called the Bradford pear. In the Southeastern United States, it's regarded as a terrible uh, scourge on the landscape because it gets out and, and breathes on its own and fills up all the ditches and um, completely smothers many native species. So it's a real problem in some parts. On the Upper West Side, there's enough concrete that this thing is not going to be spreading out as an invasive species. Instead, it's providing benefit uh, to people in, in the community. In what way? Other than uh, a pleasing canopy of green. Well, there's a swipe of a sponge across a windowsill from just a few blocks north of that tree. Where did all that dirt come from? Well, that soot that came from diesel buses, diesel trucks, and the sludge oil that is burned in the furnaces that heat many apartment buildings. That is also the stuff that is in our lungs when we breathe in the air. Yet, the trees are protecting us from some of this. Because here is my hand after pressing it against that calorie pear tree's bark after a light rainstorm. And what I come away with is all the soot that glommed onto that tree. Turns out trees are amazing soot catchers, even in winter when they don't have any leaves. Those little soot particles drift through the air and then they stick onto twigs and trunks and their little, uh, uh, the complexities of bark and the air gets cleaned. And so every breath of air that we take in the city is partly connecting us to the trees around us. And in New York City, well, you know, it's a built up area, but 20% of New York City is tree canopy. And so we get every breath of air is actually connecting us to trees in the most intimate way possible, cleaning our lungs and our blood. Trees also provide shade. It's 15 degrees cooler under this tree. Uh, on, a, on a hot sunny day, then out on the sidewalk away from the tree, come back at 2 a.m. It's still 10 degrees cooler under this tree on the sidewalk. You put your hand or a thermometer on the sidewalk, it's cool compared to 2 a.m. out on an unshaded sidewalk because the sidewalk sucked up that heat and releases it all back at night. What does that mean for New Yorkers? Well, depending on your calculations, between 15 and $80 million in saved air conditioning costs because of trees in the cities, in the city. Same thing with stormwater flow when a heavy rainstorm hits New York, some of it gets absorbed and delayed by the trees, acts as a sponge, less stormwater overflow into the rivers. And so the amount of raw sewage that 
that flows into the rivers during stormwater overflow events is reduced because of, of trees in the city. How else is the tree connected to us? It changes social dynamics. <clears throat> Here's an assignment for you next time. <clears throat> when the city gets busy again, try standing on a sidewalk that doesn't have any trees in it and just taking a call on your phone. On a busy sidewalk, you get mowed over. On sidewalks with trees along them, the trees create little blocks that create sort of safe spaces, little um, eddies along the, the white water rapids of the un, uh, the open sidewalk. There's a little pool or an eddy, and you'll see that people stand next to the tree to take a call on the phone, to talk to their kids, to smoke a cigarette, to read the newspaper, just to chill out for a few minutes. The choreography of the street is different when there are street trees present than when there are no street trees present. Uh, and you can, the, New York has plenty of examples of both, so we can compare how do people behave on a tree with, on a street with trees and one without, and the and, and behavior is, is quite different. The trees also change our sensory impressions of the city, the aromas of leaves, the sounds of, of wind in, in the leaves, the changing light through the seasons. The sound is brighter on the sidewalk with trees because they, they reflect down the upper, the higher wavelengths of, of light. This is the Bradford tree um, in the springtime with, with a magnolia in, in, the, um, in the median there in the, the Broadway Mall, uh, showing it, giving us a little window, our imagination's a window into springtime. We also changed the sensory experience of the tree. This is a little sound recording that I made with, with this device. This is a, an ex, a, a fancy accelerometer. When you, when you press this against the tree and then hook it up to your computer, you can record the sound that is in the tree itself. So I press this into the bark of, of the tree. It doesn't damage the tree. And then record the vibrations in the wood of the tree itself. And this is, is what happens. You can see these, uh, this is a spectrogram, time going from left to right, low frequency at the bottom, high frequency at the top. You can see these little uh, marks, vertical marks, are the chirps of songs of uh, house sparrows. These lines along the bottom are the rumbles and the squeal of the subway that is below growing direct. The subway grows directly below this tree in the big tunnel that goes from um, uh, from downtown to uptown, the, the one line and, and the express trains going through there. And then this curve coming down through here, this is the squeal of the brakes. Everybody's favorite sound in New York as the, uh, as the uh, train comes to a stop. And down on the subway station, this me measures like 100 decibels enough to, to blow out your ears. Um, and strong enough to make the ground shake and those vibrations come up through here. And so this is the sort of a, a weird sound recording here. We're going to share, share the weirdness with you. Um, uh, this is what the tree is sensing and feeling within it as the subway runs underneath it. Okay, you may have been able to hear the, the squealing brakes and so on, a little strange, hard to get our minds around these sounds. But the key point is the city is causing the tree to vibrate, is sonifying the tree. And therefore, the tree grows in a different way because the roots that are shaken grow stronger. Branches that are shaken add more cellulose and lignin. And so the very form of the tree itself is a very form and energy of the city is present in the form of the tree. So sound enters the tree and changes the tree, just as the tree changes uh, human uh, relations. Not, it's not only uh, the form of the tree that we're changing, we're literally giving the trees life. This is an interesting uh, uh, study done in New York. If you plant a street tree uh, and then just leave it out there, it has like 50-50 chance of being alive in 10 years. It's a tough place to be a tree. People's dogs poop and pee on it. People chain their bikes up to it. The delivery truck smashes it and so forth. However, if you involve people from the local community in planting that tree 
And if you put a little tag on it saying, hi, I'm, I'm a London plane tree, please provide some, give me some water in the, in the summertime. Don't let your dog poop here. That tree's probability of survival goes close to 100% over 10 years. So by giving trees our attention and personhood within human social networks, we literally give them life. So this reciprocity between trees and people that, that is present in the Amazon, it's present in, the, in the, the deep history of human cultures around the world, is also present in the everyday of uh, human life. I would add that it's also present, I'm gonna stop sharing here um, and turn, uh, so my video can come on. It's also present when we read a book. We are connected one human mind to another across space and time with the help of flattened sheets of cellulose. Trees unite us into bonds one to another. When we listen to music, this violin is made from uh, partly from spruce, partly from, from maple. We're hearing the second life of a tree. And so one of the, the things that really astonished me in my uh, work uh, studying trees is the extent to which after trees die, they continue to give life. I, I studied a number of trees rotting away in old growth forests and found that th those places were the most vital places in the forest. But that's not just an ecological phenomenon from old growth forests. It's present for us too. The house that I'm in now is held up with wood. The books that I'm reading, the music that I'm hearing, even the electricity coming powering this particular Zoom event is partly powered by 400 million year old trees. So even though we might imagine ourselves still to be separate, we are still bound up one to another, human to tree in reciprocal mutual interdependence. And I'll close with an invitation. And that is to pick a tree. And over the next few weeks and months, befriend that tree, open your senses, Understand what you can learn through your fingertips that your eyes cannot perceive. What is the sound of the tree? What are the aromas? And in this time of, of human isolation, it's still okay to hug a tree. It's still okay to kiss an emerging bud in the springtime. It's still okay to put our hands on the tree bark and connect with our brother sister trees most of them hermaphrodites they challenge us to expand our notions of, of, of sexuality in nature as well as uh, of ecological interconnection my invitation is pick just one tree and do a little experiment give it your attention and then see where that leads you over the coming weeks and months i'll close there and thank you very much for your attention and we'll be delighted to take any any questions David, thank you so much. I can't think of a better talk for the time. Um, it, it's just, it's the exact right moment, whatever happened in the world to bring you to us at this time. I'm, I'm ever so appreciative. Well, and we have some, some great questions. I'm gonna start with um, some of the ones that are some thinkers. So um, someone would like to know to what extent can it be said that trees hibernate can this happen both in response to ecological conditions and regularly with seasonal variation? If they do hibernate, could you talk more <laughs> about the importance not only of growing, but of resting and what we might learn about ourselves through this adaptation? That's a, such a wonderful question. In fact, if, that's an outline of a, of a 10,000 word essay right there that I want someone else to read so I can revel in it. I mean, beautiful, even a, even a book. Um, you know, so so. A, a biologist would say technically hibernation is not the right word because hibernation applies to endothermic creatures like mammals that, that reduce our body temperature, well, we don't, but bears and other things, reducing their body temperature and, and so forth uh, to make it through winter. But trees, of course, go through a, a, similar, a similar process, but they're not riding out winter by keeping a little furnace going within them. One of the things that continually still is, I think the most astonishing thing about our world is that we can walk around in winter, like in New York or in Northern Quebec and be among trees. It's like minus dozens of degrees. And these trees are still alive. I mean, they look dormant, but they're alive because the buds are full of living cells that are frozen to like minus 20. 
and all around the, every bark, of course, the underside of the bark is a layer of living cells. So the trees uh, prepare for, for that winter in all sorts of, with all sorts of biochemical tricks, drying out their cells a little bit, sometimes loading up with sugar um, uh, to, to, as, a, as an antifreeze. They have ways of deflecting the ice crystals that come by making their cell membranes flexible so that when an ice crystal pushes into a membrane, it gets deflected instead of pierced. Um, the ones that stay green through the winter um, load themselves up with what we would call vitamins, um, antioxidants that are there to, to receive and neutralize incoming photons of light that have stimulated the photosynthetic apparatus and that can't be active because it's so, so cold. So they have all these different layers um, to allow them to, um, to prepare for and, and go through, through uh, winter. Tom Kimmerer, a uh, wonderful writer, um, has, has an article, um, I don't remember which magazine it is in, but it's going around on social media now about how trees make it through the winter and dormancy and so forth. And the amazing thing in the tree bud is that all the little cells that are needed for the stem and the leaves and everything for next year are in that bud. What happens in the spring is not making lots of new cells, but the expansion of the ones that are already there. So in terms of you know, humans, the, the need for rest in, in humans, um, it would take a different form, of course, because our physiology and our, our you know, we're endotherms. We don't go into full hibernation in, in the winter time. Uh, you know, the, the humorous answer is load up on sugar, which is what the tree cells are doing, you know, which, which works for me in the, in the winter. Um, uh, but you know, more seriously is that, that in these changing seasons and cycles, there's a necessity of a multi-layered adaptation. Trees don't just do one thing to make it through the winter. They do multiple things. So if we want to withdraw and rest and so... As, as, the, as meditators would say, take time for the inhale as well as the exhale. In life, a balance between action and contemplation. We need practices to absorb the photons of energy that are driving us crazy the whole time, so, which is the problem that plants have. How that manifests in human life, of course, is gonna be very different and dependent on different, uh, on different people. But, but the season of rest uh, and renewal is, is vitally important in temperate trees. In the tropics, it's different. But even in the tropics, where things don't freeze, of course, there are cycles, the wet and the dry season. And, and, and trees like to get on the crest, they're almost like surfing the weather so that at just the right time, they can put out their fruits and, and so forth. So, um, yeah, so the analogy with humans, I think, is a good one. But but. I'm, I'm cautious about anthropomorphizing trees too much. I think we need to honor their otherness and draw inspiration from, from them in a, in, a, in a sense of analogy rather than of, of direct replication. Well, you want everyone over it load up on sugar. So trust yeah. me, everyone's good with that. <laughs> well, one other thing, you know, this, this is water, but if this were a gin and tonic, <clears throat> we'd be having juniper, uh, and also uh, the bitter bark um, um, from a South American tree in our gin and tonic. So we would be uniting our, um, uh, our celebration um, with trees in, in multiple ways. So gin and tonic is the most sylvan of all beverages. I think you will have some converts for gin and tonics, no problem. Um, so someone else wants to know if you could talk a little bit about how you went about choosing the trees that you decided to write about this person says, I'm from Northern Ontario, and I'm especially curious to, to about how you decided to write about the balsam firs in, near Kakabeka Falls. Yeah, so some of the trees, um, well, let me back up a minute. So after I wrote The Forest Unseen, I knew my, for my next book, I wanted to, to look at trees more closely and particular to look at trees that were in places that were not old growth forest. Because I think one of the, I did not, I, don't like the message that somehow you, to get to nature, you have to go to old growth. It's like, no, my hand is as natural as an old growth redwood tree. Uh, the dynamics of New York City are as natural as the dynamics of an old, old growth forest because they are the products of, the, of, of, of a primate's mind, right? And that primate is, is a natural being. That doesn't mean that it's all good. 
but what is natural and what is good is separate. Anyway, so that's for this for this book. I wanted to locate trees in very different places with different um, intersections of stories: New York, Jerusalem, the Am Amazon, and so forth. So some of those trees were ones that I'd already bonded with before the idea of this book ever came to my mind. So the one in the Amazon I'd visited as part of an exchange with Ecuadorian scientists. And we visited this site and I knew when I started the book that I wanted to go back there, which I did a couple more times. The one in New York um, was actually right after a talk at the American Museum of Natural History. I was on that program maybe in 2013, 2012 maybe. Um, so. I need a friend in the city. I'm going to go find a tree and befriend the tree since nobody else will be my friend. Um, and just wandered around and looked for a tree that just seemed like the most ordinary street tree I could find that was within walking distance of where I was. And so there was no kind of grand strategy or Excel spreadsheet picking the best tree. And of course, in New York, such an amazingly diverse city in terms of ecology and culture, a tree eight blocks north or south or over in Brooklyn or in Queens, or so well, like totally different set of stories. So this was an arbitrary selection of that of that one tree. The tree in Ontario uh, near Thunder Bay is located on rocks that contain within them the almost the oldest known sign of life anywhere in the universe. So in the Gunflint Formation, which runs from Minnesota up into Western Ontario there are fossils of bacteria that are from the very earliest days of life on earth. And those bacteria are in relationship. They live in little communities together. They're not separate individuals. So I wanted to go there because I, at that place, you have the ancient story of life, two and a half, three billion years old, combined with the modern story of life in the boreal forest, where those trees are all interconnected with the chickadees and, and other birds, and that region is also a huge hub for international trade in wood products. Uh, so a form of, inter, of, of connection. So there was the, the, the industrial, the evolutionary and the ecological were all present in this one place. So I, so I just took my tent up to, um, to the campsite there and wandered around and found a, a, it's a very small little modest tree by, by the trail. I did discover that when you're going through immigration in Canada, the answer to what are you coming to Canada for that you should not give is I'm coming to listen to trees. Uh, that resulted in a much longer interview with the law enforcement officers than I was, I was hoping for. So uh, in my uh, later visits, I'm coming to go hiking or whatever, you know, some sort of more tamer, more easily understood. Uh, yeah. So so the trees, some of them were ones I knew already and others I actually, and, the Jerusalem tree. Jerusalem, of course, is a place with lots of history, lots of modern conflict associated around um, olive trees and right on the front edges of climate change because there's nowhere else in the world that has got a deeper water crisis than, than the Middle East. Well, one or two other places have as bad a situation as that. So a, a confluence of many, many important stories so I booked a flight to Jerusalem and, and just, well, to Tel Aviv and went up there and wandered around and found a tree. And I also visited with a lot of Israeli olive growers, um, academics, and also uh, Palestinians in the West Bank to understand how people uh, were interacting with olive trees in, in different parts of, of that region. Many helpful hints. I'll, don't talk to Border Patrol about listening to trees. So we're, we're getting a lot. Eat a lot of sugar, drink gin and tonics, don't talk to border control. Um, another person wants to know, do trees communicate with each other to warn each other of an event that would be harmful? And if so, how would they communicate with each other? Yes, yeah, so we've known now for, for at least 25 years that that communication is happening. We're learning more and more about it every year. And by we, I mean the plant physiologists who are out doing these, these amazing experiments, not just with trees, but in fact, a lot of these experiments are done in the lab with bean plants and cress plants and so forth. And then some of that information is then transferred out into trees. <clears throat> so there are multiple methods of communication. Um, the, probably the best known are volatile chemicals from leaves. So one leaf in one tree get attacked by insects. It produces little chemicals that waft through the air that we can, some of them we can smell like jasminate is a, is a constituent of human perfumes. It goes through the air, 
and then it lands and soaks the cells of, a, of another tree of like totally different species. And then other tree then turns on its own defensive mechanisms against those insects. Some of those chemicals also transmit to predatory and parasitic insects that then understand, oh, there's some food here. And so the tree is in a way is calling down predators to cleanse itself of these herbivorous insects. Now, of course, the tree is not literally calling it's you know, so again this is about honoring the otherness of trees trees are not little people um they have their own forms of intelligence and communication and i'm using human words to try to convey that but there is a multi what ecologists call a multi-trophic level communication um, from trees up to predators there is also below ground communication so trees send signals th through their roots through fungal networks <clears throat> both through chemical means and possibly through electrical means to other trees to alert them of, uh, of various forms of, of danger. That forms part of a, a whole marketplace of exchange because trees below ground are also exchanging nutrients, one tree to another via the fungi and so forth. And, and you know, we're really on the very opening chapters of understanding what that all means people are very very ready to project human um analogies like this is uh, uh this is capitalism in optional this is like socialism below the ground no this is treeism these are trees interacting and negotiating as they have been for 400 million years on this planet and we need to sort of shed these these human concepts, even concepts like the grandmother tree helping her offspring, like that tree is not a grandmother. That tree is both a male and a female. And so imposing gendered human language on trees, I think is, is like not helpful. It's helpful to conveying the sense of care that trees show to one another sometimes, but it's not helpful in that it locks us into this view that, that the nature of sexuality is what 20th and 21st century North American humans think about male or female, which is like, you know, even just a couple of days in the woods will cleanse you of, of that uh, particular restricted notion of, of sexuality. So trees are generally in the temperate region, at least often just male and female within the same body, sometimes going more one way than the other. That's part of, um, a part of the otherness that we need to, to listen to and, and learn from. So yes, communicative networks um, below ground and above ground, mostly through the medium so far uh, that we know as, of chemicals. Uh, so through what we humans would call the aromas and chemical signals. Um, I'm gonna, I really like this next question because I know there have been studies about people talking to their plants and whether or not that helps them grow. And someone wants to know if trees have a measurable response to when people hug them. To when people hug them? Mm -hmm. um, depends how hard you squeeze them. <laughs> so um, I don't know of any studies on measurable response. Now, there are certainly plenty of studies of, to show that any kind of mechanical perturbation of a plant, the plant senses, right? Whether it's the wind, or insects like uh, Rex Crocroft and his, his colleagues at University of Missouri found that when insects chew on the leaf, the, those vibrations of the little mandibles on the leaf get transmitted into the plant and the plant understands and actually produces the appropriate defensive response in that way. There are sensitive plants, of course, that close up um, you know, rather dramatically. And the form of wood growth is very much responsive to repeated um, pressures of vibrations from the wind or from subways and so forth. But short-term hugging, I am not aware of. I, I would doubt, particularly for a large tree, that it would have much effect. Most, most trees often integrate multiple physical features, forces on them into their growth. So you would need to mostly, I would, to have a prolonged effect, go out and hug twigs, repeatedly because those tree, tw twigs will remember that and then your hug will be in part of their growth form. The trunk itself, now 
in hugging it, you're putting your microbiota onto, you know, from your cheek onto the tree. And so the tree, in a way, its microbiome remembers you and you take with you some of the tree on your cheek, just as when you inhale the aromas of tree leaves from walking down uh, a city street with, with leaves on it or from walking in the woods, those aromatic molecules are in your blood when you leap. You carry not just a memory of the tree, but actual physical imprint of the tree with you. And the same is true of you know, our breath um, is, is retained within, within the tree as well. Yeah. I'm going to take two more questions and I'm going to combine uh, several people want to know about some of the technology and then I'll end with a more philosophical one. Um, in general, people want to know a little more about the equipment you use to listen to tree wood and if you can describe the sound technology in a little more detail for the sound experiments and have they been used in any compositions. So sorry to combo these two, but they're, they're both like the technology ones. So. Yeah, so the main technology I use is my ears. And in fact, in many of these um, places, I do not take a camera, I do not take a recording device, I only take a notebook and a hand lens, maybe binoculars, to force myself to come back to my senses. The one of the crises we face now is almost total sensory disconnection from the living earth. And so I set myself a challenge, reconnect. And as a writer, of course, that's also when you discover the stories because you're finally paying attention, not to the settings on the camera, but to the being that you are in relation with. Now, I also do a fair amount of sound recording. And so when I do have my equipment, I'm using for audible sounds, I use a Mix Pre 3 digital sound recorder with Sennheiser microphones. I have, I've made a CD of binaural recordings of, of trees and water and, and, and people. So, and that's fairly standard recording equipment. For the more kind of weird stuff, this, this thing I was showing you earlier is an accelerometer that is mostly used in industrial applications to record vibrations in pipes and things so you can tell when the nuclear power plant is gonna blow before it blows um, by, by monitoring all the, um, the vibrations and so forth. Mostly it's used for much more tame applications than that. But it's, it's an accelerometer and all phones, smartphones have accelerometers in them picking up vibrations. You connect that accelerometer to a DI box and, well, to signal processor, then a DI box, which is a thing you'd plug your electric guitar into to connect it to the laptop. And then I just record it on um, Audacity, which is free sound recording software. So from accelerometer to DI box to recording on the computer. And I made a lot of sound recordings of, of the sound of <clears throat> inside a cottonwood tree, for example, all those leaves shimmering or an aspen tree or even an oak tree when the wind is in it amazing vibrations inside that tree. Another form of recording is, is using those accelerometers to record the munching sounds of insects inside trees, whether it's carpenter beetles or cerambicid beetles. I've also used little calipers, electronic calipers that measure the diameter of a twig every 15 minutes for months on end. And it turns out that twig expands and contracts through the night and the day. So the trees all around us in the spring and summer have a heartbeat. It's, it's not literally a heartbeat, but they're expanding and contracting as water moves through the twig and then stops at night, through the twig in the day, stops at night, pulse, pulse, pulse. And then I've sonified that by basically shortening all those, because it's a 24 hour pulse, that's like a really low frequency sound to make it audible to human ears. And indeed, there have been, I've done some sound installations with this, so you can kind of walk through some of this weirdness, um, either as performances or as, as installations. And then some, some composers have used some of this. Um, one in, in New York, Angelica Negron, uh, worked with um, the New York Botanic Garden last year to do this amazing uh, piece called The Chorus of the Forest that was in the, the, the old growth, I don't know that it's old growth, but patch of forest in the middle of the um uh in the middle of new york botanic garden there where she had four or five different choirs singing about the forest she had some of my sound recordings that she had then used to make her own music of different forms of sounds of trees little wooden robots making clacking sounds you could dial up bird sounds it was this amazing immersive sound experience and hopefully after covid there may be more performances of, of that kind of 
NYBG. So that was, that was one particularly delightful uh, way that in fact, in my next book, I write some about her performance as a way of expanding human musical imagination into the more than human world. And she, she's in New York, based in New York, amazing composer, lots of uh, great, great stuff coming from her. And it, so it was a, I, my role in that was just providing some sound files that she then did the musical work with. It sounds amazing. And it's maybe a good segue to what will be our final question. And that is, um, while respecting your call to honor a tree's otherness, have trees informed your personal spirituality? Um, yeah, so my answer to that depends on what we mean by spirituality. Um, so my spirituality is gen generally from the earth. Um, and my essay in Emergence magazine called 11 Ways for Smelling a Tree, the last chapter about that sort of outlines that some. So I do think that many religions tell us that we don't belong here on this earth that we're wayfaring pilgrims traveling to some other place. And indeed, we are pilgrims who are traveling through and we're not going to be here for, for very long. But our task while we're here is to belong and to love this place, not to have our eyes always focused on some other place. And even within environmental movement, there's a sense that so, some, some rhetoric that we've become estranged, that the nature is out there and humans are over here. And I think that is just utterly undarwinian completely non-ecological and so my my spirituality is sort of if we want to call it that is to try and embrace uh, the moment of being in sensory interconnection with these other beings and then through that and this is sort of getting philosophical iris murdoch would call this unselfing that we get out of our own senses out of our own self into the lives of others and I think that is the foundation for ethics. In fact, the, the central part of the Songs of Trees that I didn't talk about today is trying to build that ethical foundation without bringing in God. I mean, I'm agnostic. I don't know whether God exists or not, but can we have a fully Darwinian ecological foundation for ethics that's based on lived experience? And I, I think we really can, but it requires us to pay attention, uh, to, to be in relationship with the other. And so there's a sense of, the, of transcending the self there, but not transcending into some other or non-earthly realm, but to be more fully earthed and rooted. Well, I just want to thank you so much for being with thank us. You. And um, it was a wonderful talk. I'm going to pass it back to Ken, who's going to close out the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Rochelle. Wow. Well, thank you, Rochelle. And my goodness, David, thank you so much for um, for your talk tonight. I really needed to hear you. Uh, we needed to hear you. And uh, at one point, there were uh, 283 people listening to you tonight. So uh, that's, that's quite a lot of reach uh, for your branches. Um, it truly is remarkable when one considers the continuing story of our relationship with trees um, ever since we climbed out of them, basically. And you, uh, you really put your finger on the pulse of that. And uh, I could listen to you all night. <laughs> um, but I hope that when you, you return, David, to uh, take a look at that, uh, that calorie pair on Broadway. Um, I live on Broadway, and I hope you'll, you'll look me up, too. Um, I mean that very sincerely. I would love to take a, a urban tree walk with you someday well thank you and i look forward to I, mean, I love new york i lived there for some time and look forward to once again being able to be in community and in, in uh in person with with everyone i, I look forward to that it's a wonderful and so will i hopeful in, sign in, in indeed so thank you again david so much for that excellent presentation um I hope that everyone who had the opportunity to be with us tonight will return for next month's program when we present Jim Wright and the real James Bond. Until then, good winter birding, everybody. Uh, good, good winter tree observation, too. Stay healthy, stay active, stay positive. Have a very warm and wonderful January.